Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to our Nancy Drew Games review series, where we are ranking every single Nancy Drew game on six key aspects, being the story and premise of each game, the suspects, the puzzles, the music, the atmosphere, and the ending of each game. I'm your host, Jameson. And I'm Julian. What's going on, everybody? And today we're joined by our special host, Sylvia, who we haven't seen in a little while. Hey, guys. And today we are reviewing Nancy Drew Secrets Can Kill Remastered. Okay, this game is technically, what is it, case 22 and a half? Yeah, it came out just before Shadow of the Water's Edge, I think. Both this game and Trail of the Twister have the Shadow of the Water's Edge teaser at the end, so that's something. And this game, is, it's different because it's obviously a remastered of the very first game. And it was nice of them to do this because both the first and second game are pretty much unplayable today. It's Which on is really old softwares that one really can't play on now. Yeah, either of those games only work on Windows 95 or 98, and they require like a special display. And so now I have to figure out how to get like a VMware or something so that I can trick my computer into thinking that it's a Windows 98 crap top so that I can actually play them for the channel. So that's going to be an arduous journey, but <laughs> otherwise, uh, does anyone have any initial thoughts or remarks on this game before we go ahead and get into it? I appreciate it. I, there's obviously some great improvements in the graphics. The story remains almost the same. There's a good twist at the end, but there are still some notable, <laughs> some notable, there are still some notable <laughs> flaws in it that, uh, it's, it's just a, a pet peeve of mine for Nancy Drew games in, in general is when I can't make progress in a game because I haven't looked at a specific s like screen or something and there's no there's nothing telling me that I have to do something but I still can't move on into the game. I know what you mean. This is like <laughs> the epitome of a game where if you miss something important, then you cannot progress. Yeah, and it's just a little bit of a lack of direction. I don't know. It, we'll talk about it more. But Sylvia, what about you? Any big impressions? I mean, I, I want I want to pose a question. Do you think it was a good remaster? Like, do you think it was worth the time okay. that they spent on it? Do you think they... I can, I can respect the idea of them. Oh, if we're going to remaster a game, we have to start off with the first one. Mm -hmm. But... They should have just kept on going with remasters then, if they were going to do one, because at the very least, remasters stay tuned for danger, because no one can liter literally nobody can play that game unless they have, like, their local library's thrown out garbage computer that they no longer use. But the, the thing is that, like, there are so, so many other games in the, just er, before the early teens and stuff, that I would have loved to see remastered much, much more than this. And I guess that they just decided not to do that anymore. And unfortunately, we probably will never get a remaster of them in the original engine because now Midnight in Salem runs on an entirely... It runs on the Unity engine now. And it's not that I don't appreciate its remastered game. Uh, it, all I'm saying is that it's a very tough game to remaster because it's not that good of a game in the first place. Okay, yeah. Uh, on that note, this is probably the shortest Nancy Drew game, too. This is, the, uh, this is Her Interactive's first original idea. This game. Yeah. This story. Everything about it. So, uh, I think things it was, definitely improved from there, but I want to get into the review now. It was based on a book, I think. I'm not certain. I never read the New Age Nancy Drew books. And it should be noted, just as like a fun fact, Arglefump found a glitch in this game where you can, <laughs> you can speed run it by picking up an item in one save file and just... Oh yeah, I'm sure that. Yeah, bringing it into another. <laughs> he speed runned this game and he percents in like a minute and a half. Yeah, it's pretty yeah. funny. So, in that regard, I guess we should get into the story and premise. Uh, I feel like you're most equipped for it. Oh, okay, I'll just go ahead and rattle that off first. So, this game has a remarkably short case file on Nancy's desk, which is just kind of funny. Because, it, um, man, it's, it's just, like, funny <laughs> how small the case file is. It's, like, four sentences. It says, a, uh, a student was recently murdered at the local high school. The police have a few leads as to who it might be. I have been contacted by a special police detective named Detective Beach to investigate. I will be staying at Aunt Eloise's house. I don't even think it oh. says I'm calling this case Secrets and Kill. That's literally all it says in the case file for this uh -huh. game. Yeah, I, I really don't... I kind of don't get the premise, to be honest. Like, how, how, did, a, how did this guy get to Nancy? If, spoiler alert, I mean, yeah. if, spoiler alert, he's the bad guy, mm -hmm. like, how, <laughs> A, why did he hire her? B, why is he pretending to be a cop? Is he a cop? Well, that's okay. Okay. That's exactly my thing, too, is I don't understand how, it all, how did we meet Detective Beach? Why would Nancy never ask to see a badge or something? Like, yeah, and it's like, I mean, if if even one other cop had, you know, she's like, hey, what about the uh, uh, creepy 
creepy weirdo in the like green striped polo shirt <laughs> like what you know they'd be like who and he'd be caught like that like what was his plan get <laughs> yeah. the journal back like what just look for it yourself dude so just like go into the high school oh i guess he can't <laughs> yeah Maybe that's the reason. exactly yeah um so to my knowledge we're gonna get into spoiler territory here now so uh the, the police detective calls in nancy because she is the nephew of aunt eloise eloise drew who is the librarian at paseo del mar high basically uh, Detective Beach talked her into letting Nancy come down to Florida. This game takes place in Florida, so I think it's exclusively the only Florida game. And, uh, let's see, so Nancy comes down to Florida to investigate for Detective Beach, who tells her that, yeah, I need someone like you who can actually, like, infiltrate the student body to figure out the beat about this Jake Rogers kid who got murdered. But, really, he's just trying to get his journal back, which Jake Rogers stole from him, because he was an idiot who dropped it on the floor of a diner that never has any customers. Something weird I thought about this game was they kind of depicted Jake Rogers as, like, an omniscient immortal. <laughs> he's just all-knowing, and he's leaving his clues on an elaborate scavenger hunt for Nancy to find. Okay, we should and, we should wait for puzzles to talk about that, because there's yeah, a lot to say about I it. know, but it's, like, it, it, it's just a very nonsensical game. If you think about it, but, all of these precautions Jake took to hide his little clues around the school but that wasn't even like a story mechanic that like necessarily jake knew all these things it was that that was just how the early nancy drew games function that's how stay tuned for danger is too i know it, there was less of a emphasis on story more so on just like Solving nonsensical puzzles type. brain teaser riddles yeah if brain you play teasers on is a great way to summarize it if you play on senior detective the only thing that's affected in this game is no task list and the uh eloise drew password slider puzzle back in her safe at the beginning of the game is 4x4 instead of 3x3. Otherwise, it's the exact same game. Uh, so, so merging back into the premise, we meet uh, three, three suspects at the school and then one at the diner. And what I really liked was all their dialogues about Jake. Everyone hated this guy. It was pretty fun to talk about. I think I'm just going to go ahead and say right here, suspects is my favorite category in this game and that's not even to say these are astounding suspects i just think that in the remaster they nailed the dialogue as to having nancy just say like flipping burgers oh. <laughs> yeah there was, <laughs> in the first game. there was some horrible dialogue options in the first game but um uh this game you could actually lump together with the other games that have five suspects because technically the remaster does have five if you count detective beach even though he does turn out to be the culprit but otherwise, I think that the first person we ought to talk about then is probably Connie, and I think Sylvia called dibs on her, so whenever you're ready. Yeah, Connie is the hall monitor. She sits in the lounge, I believe. She's got sort of like a secret thing going on. She like entered this judo competition for men. She entered it under uh, like a pseudonym and she was like wearing a mask like the uh, first Spider-Man movie. Um, so that's not and a And she like flag totally wins, you know? Yeah, she like totally wins. So she has to like keep it a secret. And there's a lot of secrets in this game. To be fair, they, they did put a lot of secrets yeah. um, and they put a kill in there. So, you know, prop, golf clap for the game yeah, for that. The title, um, it's a good title. <laughs> <laughs> um... But anyways, uh, she oh she wants to date um, the guy who works at Maxine's Diner, uh, Daryl Gray. Yeah, she's got a big big old crush on him. Doesn't he have like a sports car or something? Yeah, yeah, he does. He likes to flex yeah. a lot. So one thing that I think is just kind of like there's no point in trying to hide it till the end. The main theme of this game is that the reason Jake had so many enemies is that he was like a master of blackmail, where basically all the suspects in the game he finds out some sort of dirt on them and then uses it to blackmail them. Like, for Connie, it's that he knows that she was the masked judo champion and she's having a lot of money trouble with her family right now and she needed that prize money to make ends meet. And so, like, he's holding it over her head now and, like, making her, I don't know, just give him special treatment in the halls and stuff and, like, let him go to the bathroom without a pass. <laughs> it's never really disclaimed what Connie's doing for him. But otherwise, like Hal Tanaka, who we talk about in a minute, he does all of Jake's homework for him because Jake found out that he was plagiarizing a paper and he's blackmailing him. He hires Hulk Sanchez, who's like one of my favorite suspects. Oh, <laughs> he's yeah. He's the maniac. Hulk is awesome. He hires Hulk as just like blackmailed into a, being a personal bodyguard. And with Daryl, his whole thing is a bit more complicated, and we should get into that for the end game. But otherwise, is there anything else we want to say about Connie, whose name we can't remember? Maybe the kanji symbol that she has? 
Oh yeah, she wears a little necklace around her neck, and it's what's it? It's the the kanji symbol, symbol? the crane, the crane, the crane from the judo. That's uh, right. I was trying place. to remember what it was. That's kind of suspicious because once we piece together, first of all, what her symbol means, the crane, and that we have this mysterious figure who won this men's tournament. You can put two and two together. That was a little piece of information that I liked about her. And I mean, okay, also uh, in the newspaper, there's a lot of articles in this game. There's a lot of reading. Mm -hmm. um, but in the article that uh, like has the judo like tournament covered, it's like the name she entered under was Nineco, which is just an anagram of Connie, and it's really <laughs> obvious. Yeah. Because what, what, they don't even like, it, like... <laughs> I'm an I idiot. Know. I read that as Ninico. <laughs> I thought it was like Ninico. some sort of Spanish name or something. <laughs> okay. I, I guess I'll take Hal Tanaka now. I think Jamie would like to review Hulk, but I do like Hal to some degree. His entire thing is that he is a exchange student from Japan, and he feels a great deal of pressure to get straight A's for his parents, for his family, so that he can someday... Uh, become a doctor. He's dead set on becoming a doctor. Yeah, he wants to make his family proud by becoming a, a doctor. And obviously the first step for that is to do well in high school, go on to do great things in college, etc. But he's got a pretty good secret. He's plagiarized a paper for his English class. And somehow, I guess Jake's got cameras somewhere. He noticed that Hal was doing this and he's holding it against him. In return, Hal has to do all of Jake's homework. And I like that this game didn't depict the guy who was murdered as some innocent little dude. I kind of like that they made him this kind of dirt Yeah, Yeah, that, that was interesting. I remember that, like, um, we, we talked to Hal first, and we played this game with our dad, and same as all the other games. And so we talked to Hal first, and he says, like, uh, oh, yeah, Jake Rogers was not really a good guy or something. And <laughs> dad just goes, he did it. <laughs> and then we go talk to Connie, and Connie calls Jake scum, and she goes, okay, maybe she did it. And then we talk to Hulk, and he says the same thing, some creep Jake Rogers. Dad just, like, was, yeah. okay, I see a pattern here. <laughs> Hal is the most polite suspect. I don't know why it is, but him and Hulk were my two favorite people to talk to in the game. They just had interesting thoughts when it came to Jake, and he just seemed like a guy that I could vibe with in high school. Maybe uh, make a study guide with, who knows. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It should be noticed that um, Hal also has like his locker right next to Jake, which will come up in puzzles for one little sequence of events. But otherwise, Hal's subplot just begins and ends with you talking to him about Jake and then figuring out that he committed plagiarism. And then you like tell him that he has to tell the school board or you will. And like, and he says he will. He owns up to it. Yeah, he does. He doesn't even try to deny it. He has dignity. Mm -hmm. That's why I like him. All right, Jamie, you want to take the one and only Hulk? Okay, yeah. So Hulk Sanchez, I think, probably was a remastered best of the characters in this game <laughs> from original to the second. Because in the first game, he was just like... he. <laughs> I don't even know what to say about He's him. He's just the perfect stereotypical meathead. Yeah, I, in the first game, it should also be noted that all the animation was actually hand-drawn and everyone looked like cartoons, and I kind of digged it because it looked much better than the animation in games 2 through 6, but around, like, games 7 and up, the characters began to look more lifelike, I'd say. Mm -hmm. But still, he he's a funny guy. There's a part of the game where you figure out that there is a special code you can push on the soda machines that activates an alarm that just starts blaring. And if you do it in Connie's room, then she just gets all angry at you and turns you into the principal and you get in trouble. And if you do it in front of Hulk, he just goes, nice one. <laughs> and then like, <laughs> yeah, he, I, I, yeah, you, I like that. Yeah, talk about his injury too. Oh yeah. So, he's got, he's a huge college prospect. Yeah. Hulk is like looking at a huge college scholarship, probably for his athletics. He and Lily Yadav would probably get along to an extent. <laughs> Uh, but otherwise, he recently had an injury at one of his games, according to Hal. Hal is one of his biggest fans, and I thought that was so wholesome, because you'd know. expect, like, the jock to bully the nerd. But Hal says, oh my gosh, Hulk is my hero. I love that dude. Uh, another reason why I like Hal. <laughs> yeah, and as far as I know, Hulk likes Hal, too. It's not like it's a one-way thing. They're just buddies, and that's just so cool, but... Uh, otherwise, yeah, Hal says that Hulk took a bad injury in one of his games lately, and he hasn't been able to play the same ever since, and it might affect his chance to play college ball. And Hulk's dirty little secret that you figure out maybe a little more than halfway through the game is that the recent, the recent pharmacy break-in that happened in the Paseo del Mar was actually him, and that he broke into a pharmacy and stole a big bag of hectanol, which is a kind of steroid. And one thing that I think was kind of clever in that sequence is that you read in the papers that hectanol is what was stolen, 
but it doesn't outright tell you that hectanol is an anabolic steroid, which would have made it very obvious that it was the athlete who did it. Mm-hmm. You ha- yeah, well, okay, but then, I mean, it's called hectanol, and his name is Hector, the Hulk <laughs> Sanchez. Like, I, okay, Wait, did they, did they I, make up hectanol? Is, is, did they just make that drug to be named after him? I don't think they I'll did. Google it. I don't think they <laughs> did. Hold up. It's called heptanol. Oh, is it? Right? Oh, oh my god. Wow. Okay, her You're kidding. They got that E rating. They had to change it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you yeah, know, you my, know what? That actually could be the reasoning. It's my buddy like a, Hepter Sanchez. <laughs> uh, out of the out of the three four secrets though, I'd say his is the most extreme. It's yeah, like an actual yeah. felony. Well, I mean like yeah. Daryl is selling okay. military secrets, so fair enough. Yeah. Yeah, maybe I should have taken it back. I don't think his crime. <laughs> in Speaking the original, of Daryl, we should get into him. Yeah, I think in the original, his crime was just like being a drug dealer or something. It wasn't that big. Mm-hmm. But uh, well, I mean, like compared to selling military grade secrets, but still, Daryl Gray is the one student who you don't see at the school. He's working at the uh, what's the place called? Maxine's Diner. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's got this cool diner with a jukebox and all this 50 steam. It, it, it brings me back to Steak and Shake before the local steak and shake workers in Cleveland <laughs> pulled off an inside job and robbed the place and they had to close down overnight. <laughs> this, is, this is actually true. <laughs> yeah. So it, it brings me back to the good old days of just getting a nice jalapeno burger and some just nice milkshake with my grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> now, in case 10, which Sylvia was also here for, we called Dave the most flirtatious suspect of all time. And then we did it again with Colin Baxter. I don't. I wouldn't say that Daryl is more flirtatious than Colin. Are you sure? Oh, he or, is. Yeah, he, I mean, I mean well, saying... he, he, he says little lines like, um, hey, I'm just saying, not playing, and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, but he doesn't he's stand like, a chance. Hey. Colin's all like... He's... No, but he's like he's he he keeps at it, you know. Yeah. He... Even though Nancy's like, yeah, hey, I've got a boyfriend. Yeah. BT Dubs. Every single conversation initiation is him. Hey, uh, and he doesn't pick up on any hints. But there you go. Yeah, I mean, like, I I still think that Colin was more flirtatious because he was like straight up simping over Nancy. You know, they turn. look alike. Colin and Daryl. Oh my gosh, maybe they're long lost brothers. Well, and then let's talk about Uncle Steve real quick. Ah, uh, yes, Uncle Steve. I think they could have made the game a lot cooler if they didn't make him seem so unprofessional. Yeah, like he was, every he's... almost every instance with him is him forgetting something or him losing his temper or just it's just little things that you pick up on that make you realize right off the get-go that he's not who he says he is it's a little too obvious oh also he's ugly he's so so ugly he looks like he belongs on how to catch a predator (laughs) yeah Yeah, he's not he's not convincing he's not he's not trustworthy i wouldn't trust him Mm -hmm. he looks a little shifty and the fact that he doesn't even like, he doesn't even know who Nancy is staying with, but he, you know, I mean, he's like, oh, come to me undercover. I'm your Uncle Steve. And he doesn't even have a name prepared for the end. He's like, uh, Aunt who? <laughs> aunt who again? And what was her address? You know, I feel like he was just, like, trying to get that so he could, like, I don't know. I, I, I didn't. Yeah, it, I didn't trust him. It's just unprofessionalism and just, like, quirky things like that that his story doesn't make sense. Mm-hmm. But uh, that wraps up suspects. I want to jump into. Oh plus- wait, wait, wait! Uh, and you Mitch would be forgiven for forgetting him because we never see him. Yeah, Mitch Dillon. Yeah, yeah um, the, he's the, the culprit of the boiler, game that we never the boiler meet. Boiler, ja- like yeah, he's like the handyman or something. Um, he's apparently real shady though. So one reason why I just can't stand the ending of this game is the culprit is someone you never meet. Yeah. What the heck? So Mitch Dillon, you you get a phone call from him in this game at least, which is just kind of like intentionally funny where as soon as you leave the teacher's lounge you get a call from uh, uh mitch dylan hvac repairs or something and it goes i'm warning you nancy drew stop meddling or else and then nancy just calls him right back and he goes mitch dylan hvac repairs how can i help you and she goes hey you just <laughs> called me and threatened me she's like uh no i didn't she's like yeah you have i have caller id i saw it was you <laughs> this guy is such an idiot that was weird that they decided to put that phone call in the game because it like kind of makes things really, really obvious. I think that the big reveal they were going for was just that there's a different culprit, and it's not Mitch Dillon, it's this other guy we made up. For the remastered 
version of this game, it would have done the green. It would have done the game a great service to have him as an animated character you can talk to. I mean, in the original game, you got to have like a pseudo shootout. I mean, you got oh, you yeah. had to, like yeah. knock the gun out of someone's hands, like pick it up. The ending of um, this game in the original was just so so crazy. But I don't think there's any place for us to talk about it here, and hopefully we'll be able to review it whether or not we've been able to play it firsthand. Otherwise, yeah. Puzzles. Puzzles. It's it's time to get into the puzzles in this game. Now, Oof. I can award this game on having maybe four or five puzzles. <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah. all. <laughs> yeah, that's about fair. So the one word to describe puzzles is brain teasers. You Like, playing this game, you can instantly tell there's a different vibe in the puzzles. It's And a lot of it comes from Jake even after he's dead, having set up a bunch of weird things for a scavenger hunt for Nancy to follow. It's so, so weird because I would have thought the one thing you would want to change in a remaster of a game like this is that you wouldn't want all these garbage, nonsensical puzzles all over the place. Because the way that this works is like, Jake was in charge of the bulletins at the school, and every week he would go through and put up the new bulletins about school plays and volunteer groups and stuff like that, and in every single one, he would just find space to put in a coded message and then like one of 18 elements on the periodic table with like a strange direction that you would need for the end game puzzle. That's a horrible thing we'll talk about probably at the end of puzzles because that's like the worst puzzle in the game that they could have made. But all these things are just so nonsensical because like they all talk in rhymes mm -hmm. and riddles and like this Jake guy was really full of himself. Like if I went to school with him, I'd probably shove him down the stairs too. I don't know if I'd <laughs> want him to die, but this guy was such an idiot. Uh, yeah. Okay, the the glaring huge puzzle of the game is having to find all 18 or 19. I'm still not even sure which one it is. I think it's 18 and the first one you find when you uh, just find his notebook. Okay, that makes library. sense. But it, it, the puzzle starts after you escape the boiler room death scenario. And you need to find his 18 little symbols he's thrown around all the little bulletin boards in the school. And the game will not let you solve the puzzle unless you you have to search through every single screen of the game. You have to look at every single bulletin board. And there's a lot of bulletin boards. And it just was not very well done. Nor does Nancy make any sort of note. There is no line of dialogue when she's, I don't know, seen them all. She can't write them all down. There's nothing in observations. It's just very loosely done. I did not like it. Yeah, I feel like it's it's not said a lot, but I feel like one of the shining aspects of this game is when you play on junior mode, you get to have, like, Nancy writes stuff down for you, and she, like, writes down exactly what, you're, what, like, what you have to do, because... You know, typically we have a lot of stuff to balance, but in this game, there's not a lot of stuff to do, and Nancy doesn't help you with the stuff that there is to do, so it's like the worst of both worlds, you know? So here's the big problem. There is very, very little prompting on what you need to do and what you need to investigate in the game besides all of the coded messages that Jake leaves around. And so, like, if you don't understand how railroad code from White Wolf of Icicle Creek works, or just that you're supposed to like read it backwards or upside down, or just that it's a code in the first place, you might take a look at that and think, wow, they were lazy and just put in a bunch of gibberish there, then it will literally take you forever to realize that your objectives are right in front of you, just like plastered on the wall. Like that's how you figure out the code to the soda machines where it'll say like grape, grape, cool soda or something or something like that. And it's so annoying because whenever you do a puzzle like that, there's just no prompting in your task list, no prompting by any suspect. You just have to look around for all the different codes and clues on the bulletin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's it's really abstract. It's not like you. This is one of the few cases that Nancy actually cooperates, like with the police. Like she's part of the investigation, or so she thinks, right? Yeah. But you know, that's not like where's the police work? You know, there's like that. There's like an opening cutscene, I think, where you know it's like, oh, there's a murder here. But it feels like they just cleaned up and left and Nancy got nothing. And so now she's she's just reading the bulletins in this school. That's her investigation, you know? Okay. So like, what? Yeah. What? Something I don't get is that, you know, after a student dies, there's going to be uh, initial police search through the school and everything. 
somehow they missed in the library there is an open journal with jake's signature on it with a bunch of clues yeah <laughs> like why was nobody giving any red flags to this journal uh, it doesn't make any sense also right under that seat is his end game puzzle with like gosh what's even in that box is that where it's he the keeps videotape the... that's the second videotape then yeah because mm -hmm. there's two okay so and then other than the main overarching puzzle of finding all the elements converting them to astrology signs whatever it is nothing else is really that notable you get like two little cheeky puzzles right at the start with a slider puzzle and entering greek symbols into a safe that's not much of a puzzle but it's something and then other than that what else is there like the boiler room puzzle i guess the soda puzzle there's is there seriously only five in this game there's opening jake's locker which okay. is just clever I feel like I could have used more direction because there are very little times in the franchise where Nancy's supposed to use her phone to figure out a puzzle, so people probably wouldn't have thought that far, where if you ask Jake Hal if he knows anything about how to get into Jake's locker, Hal will say, no, I don't, and that's all he says. Then you go talk to Hulk, and he says, eh, maybe Hal would know, he was right next to Jake, and then you have to ask, ask Hal again, it should be noted that you have to ask him two times. And then the second time he says, one day Jake said he couldn't get into his locker, and he said it would be helpful if he had his phone handy. And so the way that it works is that in order to get into this locker, you're supposed to look at your phone keypad for all your digits and determine what three letters you get for every number that's on the phone. Like, one would be A, B, and C, two would be D, E, and F and so on. You'll, if you ever had like an old track phone, then you know the struggle. And basically you just figure out what four let numbers spell out the letters J-A-K-E for Jake's name. And then that's the combination. I think it's just 5253 or something. Okay, that's a good puzzle. I don't think it was. It was clever, but there was no direction for it. Yeah, lack of direction, but clever. I don't know. Wait, there's seriously nothing to indicate that Jake has to be the... No, th there's not very much. I mean, maybe there's like a bulletin board a riddle somewhere, but all that Hal tells you is that Jake once said, I couldn't get into my locker, sure wish I had my phone right now. Hmm. Yeah, I get. I mean, that's the one huge flaw of this game is lack of direction, so. It's clever, it's I can not, see where they were going. It's that they subjected all of their direction to reading riddles written by a madman on bulletin boards. <laughs> you know. Oh, okay. I guess, uh, Puzzles is truly not much to say. The end game isn't even that intense. You just have to enter three wrong combinations, or at well, least tell Detective Beach to enter three wrong combinations. You no, know, no, no. Let's let's just wait till we get to the end game because I think that the end game was kind of. Yeah, I kind of like that. Yeah, I like that. Okay. I mean, it, okay, it's a little bit on the nose. You know, it's a little bit her. look up, but we'll we'll get to that. All right, moving on to music then. Now, seriously, I don't I don't think music's that bad. It's pretty catchy. Music's pretty good. I like like I commented on the long play that you had. That one track that was like the Phantom of Venice remixed I like mean, dance track. That's that kind of was like really good, yeah, right? To be hard. fair, that's Phantom of Venice soundtrack. But at the same time, okay. I think it's cool that in the remaster they included a jukebox and Maxine's where you can use quarters to just like play music. Also, we got Barnacle Blast the game coming back from Haunted Carousel. That was a fun one. Could we actually play it? Yeah, you just needed a quarter. Oh, okay. Yeah, we didn't do anything with the currency in this game. <laughs> yeah. But, um, you know, okay, uh, looking through the soundtrack, each song has a really weird name. It's, like, almost incomplete. So. That, that's not very important. It looks to me like for when they were naming the file sizes for this game, they were just like, oh, okay, that's the MP4 file for the Aunt Eloise music. Just title it A-N-T- H O U and people will know. Oh, that's Ant House. Why would they? Okay. But I don't. I don't well, know. I don't work for her interactive. That's also my favorite track. Those Aunt Eloise. There weren't that many tracks, but there were a couple that were pretty good. It should be noted that this track does reappear in some other games, almost as an Easter egg. I know you can hear it, Legend of the Crystal Skull, on the cemetery scale model. We'll go ahead and play it right here. So there are a couple more tracks that I think are fairly iconic. We should go ahead and just start off with Mystery Light, as it's called. They, they really didn't give us much to go off with the titles for this game. This will play most often in the school hallways, in the library, when you're exploring the place and trying to figure out where everything is. And it's a delightful track to listen to. I think it's something else, to be certain. But overall, like... It's simple, and I think that's what sells it. Nancy Drew games with simple exploration tracks always seem to take off, so I'll go ahead and play that here.
This game had such, so many out of place songs that were on the jukebox. This one had like, like Asian oriental music that sounds like it's out of Shadow at the Water's Edge. And it also had like yeah. Hawaiian music. And I guess we could just play little clips of those here and there, but it was just such a- Did those games come out already or was that like a teaser? I guess it was a teaser. I mean like Kapu K was already out, but this was the game before Shadow at the Water's Edge. But the thing is that music was in the original too, to my knowledge. They just had huh. all sorts of really, really weird music that was on the jukebox that had no place in the game. It certainly has no place logically being on a jukebox in a vintage 50s diner. So I... Yeah, what's the time period for this? Because if, you know, if there's a game that goes into the 1930s, is this like a game in the 19 like what this is 1998 I, mean, I guess that they were just trying to go for a vintage steak and shake vibe okay. with maxine's diner but it, it's weird yeah. i've never actually thought about the time frame i guess yeah going off when it first came out my understanding is that every game that isn't secret of the old clock takes place in the year it came out i mean like you do see some dates in some games like bruno Bolet's crypt is dated to 2007 when he died so Wait, what is Nancy? I like how Nancy pro game? progressively gets a more oh. and more useful phone. Yeah, but that that is a good point. Nancy has a smartphone in this game. Maybe they just kept it because it was the remaster to make it easier to go mm. with. Anyways, that's a little off topic. There's a couple more tracks we want to talk about besides the out of place musical jukebox ones. I think that the fear and danger track is kind of intense. It's just like some heavy piano that just keeps on going. Anyone want to say anything about that before we play it? It's extremely reserved. I don't even remember hearing it at the end of the game. Maybe that one was more in the original, too. I think but it was. It's not necessarily the danger track, but either way, it's just like the alternate suspicion track. We'll play it right here. And then finally, I want to play a track that I don't even know if was in this version, but it's kind of a cool Easter egg. This is the excitement track from Secrets Can Kill, and it was certainly in the original game because little known fact, in game one, this was actually the title music for the franchise. Stay Tuned for Andrew was the first game with the iconic startup theme with the whole da na 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 Yeah, that's a classic. Instead, oh. Secrets Can Kill, the original, had this as its title music. Whether you like it or not, this remaster is a direct upgrade from the original for one reason in particular. There's not discs that you have to insert yeah. to go oh. from place to place. Okay, yeah. I don't even know if you could have bought the original digitally, but the original game, another... Th you know what? We'll just put that in here, I guess, because... <laughs> It's just, we're just roasting this game of everywhere. I mean, there's only two locations, right? Three, maybe? Uh, three, but Ant Eloise is, is extremely underused. Yeah, man, there's, um, literally, you had to pop in disc one and disc two accordingly if you wanted to go to different places. This was like the old Flash game that they had at the computer lab when you were in first grade. It's, it really, really has a lot of age to it. I don't know if, I think Stay Tuned for Danger might have been that way too. But then, like, the rest of the games were two discs to install, but only disc one to play, which was the right move. I want to move into Atmosphere now, and I'm going to say I think Atmosphere limits this game again. Yeah, having three locations isn't the best, and one of those locations is virtually obsolete for all of the game. <laughs> yeah. Sylvia, do you have a favorite? Um, I mean, the diner was pretty cool. I wish you could actually, oh my gosh, can you imagine? Th this game would have been like 50 times better if you could like order all the weird stuff that's on the menu. Yeah, and, like, like $13 actually have, like, cheeseburgers. <laughs> yeah, you know, well, okay, that's a lot of money. They'd have to add, <laughs> add, add a way for us to make money, but you know what I mean? Uh, my favorite part of the game, I mean, it's probably the school just because of what it offers, but specifically in the school. I gotta say this is a nice library. It's a decent library. I appreciate the old 90s-esque green lamps with okay. like the cool incandescent bulbs. I always loved those. Okay, but and I just remembered why I like this school. It's because it feels like a real high school. Okay, yeah. It, I, I it can... really does look like a real high school. I liked that for it. I mean, it's, it's Paseo Del Mar High. It's got the same building materials in the walls. They got the same lockers. You never go- I like that their uh, mascot is a manatee. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, that's kind of cool. I, I like that Hulk is like- He's like, ah, oh, come on, I've been trying to change that thing, I hate it. <laughs> he's kind of funny like that. He calls yeah. him a sea cow or something. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, yeah, just the school in general compared to, what, the two other places we can go to. And it's just because it felt very 
school-like. I don't know. I, I feel like it, it would be pretty easy to fail a school setting, but they did it pretty good. You know, I'm going to be honest. I mean, like, I don't know what they were going for in Waverly Academy, but this feels more like a school than Ramsey Hall does in Waverly Academy. Okay, I no, Ramsey Hall is not the school. It's then why dorm. is there a history classroom in there? Just for funsies. <laughs> Ramsey what? Hall is a dorm room. It's a dorm-style building. Fine, okay, but... Okay, the game did a good job capturing the essence of a public school. Okay. Sylvia, did you say you had a favorite location? The diner? Yeah, I like I like the diner, I like the jukebox, and I guess there's a game in there. I didn't know that. It might um, the game might actually be in the student lounge, but now okay. that I look back on that, I guess it doesn't make sense to have an arcade game in a public school, but I don't know. What was your favorite place, Jamie? I'm gonna have to go with the diner as well. I like just having the jukebox. I love the nonsensical puzzle in the back where there is a gas leak being prevented <laughs> by oh, yeah. just having a socket wrench come up. And I think it's funny that the uh, one music, the ch 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 Oh yeah, it, it, it only, you're totally right. That's when it plays. <laughs> that only, only plays when the gas leak is happening. You can like pick up the pipe, the gas starts leaking, and then you put the pipe back down it just disappears immediately and also like the two endings where the game with the school explodes one where the murderer straight up blows up the entire school and everyone in it just to kill nancy by trapping her in the boiler room and then the other where the gas leak happens at maxine's the maxine's gas leak was so so unnecessary did you know that you don't even need that bolt cutter it's optional Really? Yeah. But really? You don't use it for anything? I mean, you optionally can. When you get locked in the boiler room from that letter that Mitch Dillon gives you, uh, the boiler is chained shut with a padlock on it, and the padlock mm -hmm. answer is 1971, which you can see on the plaque in there. It's the year that Paseo Del Mar was founded. And Nancy can either just cut it off with the bolt cutters, or she can figure out that that's what the password is and just put in 1971. You I like that she can... There's, like, this alternate Nancy. Like, you can either play her, like really observant or you just play the uh, Brute force. me steal me cut open chain yeah. <laughs> yeah. I like that alternative too and that you, you know that never clicked in my head that sequence is completely unnecessary yeah and also she replace... just waltzes right into the kitchen that is not a valid way to fix a gas leak I just I just want to make sure that everyone a who spoon? played this game <laughs> understands like, I, I mean, soup okay. ladle yeah, there's nothing that's more like stable that you I like I don't know a chunk of wood like it a spoon is like the most circular object in a kitchen you can have. <laughs> <laughs> that's not structure. Oh my god. Okay. okay. I say we jump into the ending now. So this is where I mean we start to see a little differentiation from the first game at least. I'll go ahead and give the rundown of this. So there are two pivotal uh, videotapes that you find in this game. The first one being in after Mitch Dillon sends a letter to Daryl Gray to get you to come down to the boiler room, and it says like, "I have the answer to your mystery. Come meet me in the boiler room at Paseo Del Mar High." And so Nancy gets down there, and the boiler's at full throttle, and she has to like set it off before the school and everyone in it explodes. Explodes. Nancy finds a videotape down there on her way out, which she then takes back to Aunt Eloise's houses and pops into that classic 1998 VCR, where she sees three different distinct videotapes. The first is of uh, Howe copying a essay written by Prudence Rutherford in, into his essay. I don't know how they weren't able to figure out that this was a 100% published essay by Prudence Rutherford. Plagiarism is not that easy to get away with. You can't just copy word for word from a book. That's that's like, yeah. that's not even how real plagiarism happens, but still. And then uh, Hulk Sanchez, he gets like a video of him putting a box of steroids in his school locker, which I guess was incriminating enough just to show him holding a box. And then he shows one of Connie coming back to her locker and just taking off the mask and putting it in, revealing that she's the masked judo champion. But there's nothing particularly about Daryl Gray in that videotape, which is really interesting, because that is in the second videotape, which was Jake's highest priority top tier blackmail that he had. And that was the Daryl Gray and his dad's business situation. So once you solve the weird 18 step puzzle underneath Jake's seat in the uh, library, you get a second videotape. And this is where really the end game begins. Nancy, oh, I mean, first you can go ahead and confront everybody about all of their uh, sins and misdeeds and say, hey, I know that you're stealing and using steroids. I know that you committed plagiarism. I know that you did this and st snuck into this competition. 
basically, with Daryl Gray, you prop in this videotape. In the original game, I believe he was like a drug dealer or something. And he may have actually worked together with Hulk to steal the steroids from the pharmacy. But in this game, he has a very strange plot where he has been stealing blueprints for like technology and weapons and stuff from his dad's factory. It's like military grade equipment and secrets. And he's been selling them to Mitch Dillon, the school janitor, who apparently is fencing them off to some higher power. I don't know if it's a foreign government. Maybe he's working with the Fredonian government with Yanni Vokstaya. <laughs> there's, there's no real telling. Jake figured this all out when Detective Beach, who he shows his videotape of on the VHS... By the way, you hear Jake narrate this whole thing, and he sounds like a jerk, but it's kind of funny. He has, like, the snobbiest voice. He's a goofy guy to listen to. I liked it. Yeah, he... Oh, yeah, sp speaking of the end of that, I really liked the, the end of that, where he's, like... I'm gonna I, be retired it's... at 17. Yeah, I'm gonna be <laughs> retired at 17. So by the time you watch this, which, like, sort of, like, snaps into the realization of, oh, crap, like... Oh man, he's and then dead. he's like, uh, he's like, yeah, I'll I'll be you know living it up on the beaches. I'll be living and the he, high life. He shows the flyer of Dread Isle for Ransom of the Seven Ships. Like, yep, this is where <laughs> I'm going. <laughs> I don't know. And then and then like with the knowledge that he, this guy got this guy got murked. Yeah. This guy got killed, and now and like the guy that did it or like is involved with it has been the guy that you've been like blabbing all the secrets to. Yeah, basically you know? what happened that went wrong with Jake's plan was that Detective Beach lost his notebook at Maxine's Diner, which Jake picked up because Jake worked there with uh, Daryl. And he realized that it had all of these super, super expensive blueprints and stuff that he was going to sell to someone with the highest bidding. So he made an arrangement to meet with Mitch Dillon that midnight at the school to go ahead and barter with him and like just say all right i'll give you this bet to me if you give me this much money and apparently it did not go how jake intended because mitch shoved jake down the stairs and he died of his injuries because jake didn't actually have the journal with him he discloses in the videotape that you find at the end that he taped it under a book cart in the school library and it's so infuriating because you walk past this book cart all the time and you can never look at it and if you're replaying this game, you know that the solution mystery solving diary is right under that book cart and there's nothing you can do about it. But anyhow, just as the videotape ends, Deus Ex Machina, or more like Satan Ex Machina, you hear the door open and Nancy just goes, uh, Aunt Eloise, is that you? And so she walks out into the foyer and just Detective Beach and his ugly polo are just standing right there. And here we get one of the uh, it's not the first official instance of a gun being drawn i guess the original has that where nancy title. picks up the gun and puts it in her inventory and has to point it in mitch dillon yeah but detective beach straight up pulls a gun on nancy Boom. what happens is he says hey nancy i was just wondering if she had new leads with that uh with the case you know and nancy goes yeah as a matter of fact i just found this vhs tape that shows me where your journal is oops i i mean the uh jake's journal come he on goes, but why does nancy say that though? i know it's just ah. like come no on, you nancy. said my journal come nancy on. you said my journal and so he goes how about we go move into the living room and have a nice chat and he just pulls an m1911 on you yeah that it, was shocking it's it's actually really really funny because if you look down the barrel of the gun at a certain angle you could see that they forgot to render the end of the barrel, so it's just like a hole, the hole that goes right through the gun. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you can, like, see his shirt on the other side. <laughs> That's pretty good. Yeah. All right. But the solution is that you have to tell him the journal is stashed away in the safe, Aunt Eloise's safe that was the very first thing you have to do in the game. Yeah, if you mess up the safe combination, we didn't show this to Dad, so he was very confused. Uh, if you mess up the combination of her safe three times in a row, her anti-burglar alarm comes down, dropping a massive jail cell from the ceiling right on top of Nancy. And so, it's a clever ending where you can tell him, like, or she has like, now tell me, Nancy, you get three chances. Where's the journal? And you can say, like, oh, it's in the <laughs> you drawer. You get three chances. That's <laughs> yeah, yeah. just so dumb. <laughs> oh, it's in the drawer. Oh, it's under the coffee table, stuff like that. But you want to tell him, oh, it's in the wall safe, and just keep on giving him the wrong combinations uh one thing that i think was kind of clever was that not everybody who plays these games knows the greek alphabet it's, i don't know it for sure and surprisingly apparently detective beach does 
if that's <laughs> even your real name. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's like a hard puzzle, isn't it? Well, like, how is he, you know? It's, it's kind of... Is he, like, having to research on his phone? Like, okay, what, 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 what was that one? Move Fi Fi Data? <laughs> yeah, it's funny, because, like, uh, Nancy, he'll go, like, what's the password, Nancy? And then Nancy has to say to him, like, oh, it's Delta Phi Sigma Kappa or Sigma Phi Kappa Kappa. And sigma, the, the, sigma, 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 Sigma. The thing is, if you give him the right combination, because one of those answers is the right combination, he'll open it and realize there's nothing in there. And so... You have to kind of remember back to the game, crap, which one was it? Okay, I don't think anything repeats. It's definitely not Delta, 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 Delta. Basically, you just have to make sure you pick the wrong option three times in a row, and then the burglar alarm falls down on him. I mean, realistically, he has a gun with him. Yeah, he could I, shoot you through it. Yeah, I don't know why he doesn't, like, just hold Nancy at gunpoint through the slats of the bar. But, um, I mean, she she was in the other room, wasn't it? They saved on animation for this part. No, they, they show him in the jail cell, yeah. implying that Nancy's right there in front of him. Well, I'd be, dude, I'd be gone. I'd be, <laughs> I'd, I'd be gloating from the other room. I would not double check. Yeah, Nancy just bucks out right the out the window. window yeah, I, I seriously would. Okay. But so. there you have it, Nancy's <laughs> first game in the books. Unless you count Secret of the Old Clock, which she solved about sixty years before. <laughs> yeah, very mixed feelings on this game. Uh, the endgame letter basically just wraps up that everyone comes clean with their crimes and no one really goes to prison besides Jake. And actually, Besides no, Jake? No, Jake is dead. Besides Mitch and Detective Beach Steve, Uncle Steve man. Uh, Nancy's, it ends with Nancy actually in POV at the beach down in Florida, which I thought was cool. Mm -hmm. And she sets down the letter and then just looks up to get her tan on. And I thought that was a neat ending. Uh, then there's the Shadow of the Water's Edge teaser and that's the end. Now, real quick... I feel like we should have, and I, this, this game, there's no denying it, they did a lot of things wrong, both in the original and in the remaster. So I think we should have a brief discussion. What could they have done to make this game better? Okay. So. I would have liked it. Slightly different take in the story if Mitch Dillon was a janitor at the school. I agree with that. And also, likewise, I feel like they could have had him be a suspect at the school of the janitor and just gotten rid of someone like Hal or Hulk or Connie, just one of the characters, because it would have been cool to have someone who's not just a student. I said the same thing about Waverly. Imagine if he was like Gordy from Ned's Declassified School Survival Guide and he wasn't even <laughs> the culprit and he was just like the friendly janitor that you talk to. No, I mean, it's still keeping the culprit. It's just unexcusable to have the culprit be someone we'd never meet on screen. <laughs> I mean, they did advertise that this game has a different culprit. Which is Sylvia, did. What, do you, what about you? Um, okay. So, first things first, every game can be improved with a cooking mini game, non mandatory. <laughs> but, like, come on. We could, you know, then we could, we could do it for tips, and then we'd have money to, like, oh, can we have another location, please, where we can buy things or, like, do anything? Fill in a short order cook at Maxine's Diner. Yeah, I mean, seriously. Well, what's Florida about this game? Like, what, you know, it's. Mm hmm. I, I like I don't know. They could have done something. Bernie could have have had another cameo. Yeah, Bernie the alligator. <laughs> no, I. I if they added a beach to this game, that would be so so much different. If he could go down to like the shore, maybe instead of Maxine's diner, he works like a concession stand at the beach. I think maybe they should have made the pharmacy an actual place you can go to. Yeah. Oh yeah. Just for one thing, hands down, this game needed more locations. The Definitely. map screen was just pathetic. It looked like the wilderness, which is not what Florida looks like. I have ne I have never been to Florida and I know that. It just it's just like a whole bunch of palm trees and foliage and then there's just a school, an apartment building and a diner sticking out of the wilderness and those are the three places you can go to. Yeah. Yeah. Any other place I, I don't know, like, if it... And even within the locations, there wasn't that much stuff there. I just wish there was more stuff. It, you know, if you're gonna t take the time to remaster a game, you may as well just look at look at the previous game as, like, the bones, and know that everyone expects a real, you know, breathing game. You know, something with some, mm, some meat on those bones, you know? I mean, it just feels like secrets can kill, too. They kind of flubbed it again. Well, I think the reality is that it was probably rushed production. Probably, it came out yeah. in between two games. I mean, okay, yeah. To be fair, then Shadow at the Water's Edge, which has been, like, a long stay in this series, came, like, right after this. But, I mean, if you're gonna... And they never tried to remaster anything else, unless you count, like, the 
the like <laughs> iPad release of Ghost of Thornton Hall or like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Man, I just, I wish that they didn't stop remastering games here. If this was just as bad as it is and they said, okay, rough start, but we're gonna keep on trying to remaster them, that would have made me so happy. Even if like Stay Tuned for Danger Remastered had the same weird brain teasers, just getting a remastered message in a haunted mansion and seeing chiseled CGI Lewis Chandler's face, that would be amazing. <laughs> But yeah, I it, well, like now they're going to this is the best chance they're ever going to get for that is now, you know, taking whatever assets they can or, you know, repurposing textures, etc. for the Unity engine and then rebuilding. Yeah, I mean, could you, you know, it's possible think, we could see some like, remasters I, in the that, Unity engine. I don't know. All right, let's get they'd on. They'd have to add. They'd have to add a lot to make this game worth remastering again, though. I would have to. I, I add that. Yeah, I, I think that's off the table. We probably. should probably go ahead and get into the ranking series, the ranking part of this review. So real quick, I'll go ahead and just give the quick rundown. The way that we do these games is that we rank it A through F because we don't like to give numbers out of ten because some nice games are better on paper than they are in practice. So A is good. F is just horrible. And then S tier is the best of the best reserved for the greatest Nancy Drews in the series. Who wants to go first? I'll take the reins first. <sighs> okay. The story of the game is probably the weakest part. And then Suspects is probably my favorite part. Uh, the atmosphere limits at a ton. I don't know. To be specific, what I don't like about the game is there's a lack of instruction for puzzles. The puzzles as a whole are nonsensical, and I'm still convinced that Jake is some immortal person. <laughs> I don't know. What I did like was hearing every single suspect's dialogue on Jake, everyone giving their two cents on what a rough guy he was, and having to... I don't know. I just think that they nailed the, st the suspects in the high school setting. That was cool. But uh, overall, it's a bad game. Like I, I can't sugarcoat it. I'm gonna give it a. I'm gonna give it a D. I said what I said. This is the remastered. Even is a D. It's just a, it's a tough game to work with. Sylvia, you wanna take it next? Yeah. Um. I feel like. Okay, and I I did also like asking you know all the students what they thought of it because you know if if it was just really just a push down the stairs that killed Jake. You know, uh, anyone could have done that, you know? Mm -hmm. And so you, everyone has a motive. Everyone's got, you know, but, you know we, we rule them out uh, one by one, I think. But I, I think this game needed more genuine detective work, not just, you know, I mean, having like one or two like coded riddles on like his locker or like his favorite spots, you know, you could like, you know, there could be like a puzzle where you try and go to Jake's favorite spots and, you know, there's codes there. They're not just plastered all over the high school you know it, it, this it's a wasted it's kind of a wasted remaster and i also wouldn't give it anything you know maybe if you loved the game i could give it a c but i would give it a d i've got you know there's nothing if i played the original maybe i would feel differently but this game doesn't do it as a standalone without having played the original okay so i think that in the long run, it's a tragedy that Secrets Can Kill was the first game in the franchise. Because just using logic, you can infer... I agree with what most of you guys said, by the way. I'd say that puzzles is my least favorite category. I love the suspects, though, in regards to the, in comparison to the puzzles. It's a real tragedy that this was the first game that they made. Because if they were going to commission remasters like they did for game 22 and a half, then it only stands to reason that they would logically have to start off with the first game. I mean, like, alternatively, they could have tried holding a poll or something to see, hey, fans, what game do you want us to remaster? But then it could have gotten, like, poll bombed and they have to, like, get stuck re remastering Secrets by the Scarlet Hand or something. But the problem is that so, so, so many other games deserved a better, uh, deserved a remaster much more than this one. It's Ghost a, Dogs. Ghost Dogs, Danger on Deception Island, Secret of Shadow Ranch. Final Blackmore scene, Manor. Treasure World Tower, Blackmore Manor, mm -hmm. Message in a Haunted Mansion. I mean, it's just, it makes me cry to think of all the games I would have so much rather seen remastered. They wouldn't even need to add new puzzles. They have all pu the original puzzles in those games were just fine, but this game had horrible puzzles to begin with. And I feel like you had to cut it some slack the way that it was in the first iteration of the game. That was the first go with the franchise. It was the best they could do. But the fact that they didn't even change anything from the first incarnation to the remaster 
is just kind of disheartening. All that being considered, this is probably going to be my first and only F for a Nancy Ooh. Drew game. I, wow. I, it's, Fair. I would say that I like the original more than this because it's it's just so annoying that they thought that they would remaster this game and do it so poorly when any other game they could have remastered with less effort, less new endings, and less new characters, and it would have been better just because the base game was good but with outdated graphics. That concludes our review for an Nancy Drew Secrets Can Kill Remastered. We will do our best to someday be able to review the original Secrets Can Kill, as well as Stay Tuned for Danger, and Secret of the Old Clock once we figure out how to get that to work. But <laughs> otherwise, we hope you all enjoyed our review, everybody. It's always a pleasure to have Sylvia around for these. Yeah, it's always a pleasure to be here. I, I like I like talking Nancy Drew with the boys. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, a um, it's a pretty short game, and we figured that in order to make it the length of a regular review, it'd be nice to have a third voice of reason. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, stay tuned for the Captive Curse review. That is... I, I have some opinions on that game. It's a great Banger one. Banger of a game. Yeah, I always love that one. Uh, otherwise, we hope you all have a good weekend. Take care, everybody. And vote for Holt. Vote for Holt, everybody. Vote for Holt. <laughs>